uh, I am uh, currently at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. If you haven't heard about that institution, it's mostly famous for the fact that a lot of people who are working in the area of gene therapy, and especially in the RNA therapeutics, and I'm pretty sure that there are people here in the audience or in your department who do exactly that, um, i.e. using um, various RNA-related constructs for treating human disease in the future and developing um, methods of delivery. Um, probably heard about it, but it's, it's the claim to fame of this medical school. It basically focused on gene therapy. I am focused on imaging. In addition, um, we're doing some research is more or less related to cell biology of cancer. I am also affiliated with uh, the Department of Cell Biology. And we're sitting in this building that's on the first slide. Um, so what I will be trying to do today without trying you know, to lose you in the process is to tell you about our work that is related through the years into high resolution imaging of inflammation, especially inflammation of vascular wall because of the importance of obviously all the cardiovascular disease. Since we are in, with medical school, that's one of the major focus of our work. I will be talking about MR imaging agents and why and the encapsulation may be interesting to explore as one of the strategies in developing contrast agents. And primarily because this is the center for nanotechnology encapsulation, obviously, is something that you are interested in. I will be talking about imaging molecules as sensors and encapsulation, too. And uh, the significant portion of what I'll be talking about will be about the biomarkers of inflammation, primarily enzymes. So I, as, as Sasha said, I graduated from the Department of, of Chemical Enzymology, and, and this is certainly dear to my heart. And finally, about the models in using the, uh, this mild peroxidase enzyme as a marker of inflammation. So uh, if you talk about the contrast agent development, as you know, there are the variety of um, types. And most of the people in the clinical environment are working with the small molecules. And the reason is very simple is because the small molecules are easy to excrete. And in radiology, radiologists prefer to deal with the imaging agents that can leave the body instead of sitting there. But the interesting part is that you can take all of these small molecules and also make bigger molecules from them. And by doing this, you're moving from sub-nano to nanoscale. And as a result, there are some interesting properties you can gain. So I will be talking a lot about magnetic resonance imaging today. And what you probably need to remember, if you don't know already, is that most of the MRI we do in the clinics is proton MRI. And the reason for this is that to do MRI, you need nuclei in the object you're looking at, which obviously every physical object has. But those nuclei should have non-zero nuclear spins. And those nuclei are primarily protons in the human body. So we're looking at protons. And looking at protons, the majority of those protons are water protons. So, uh, you know, uh, um, radiologists are kind of tuned to look at the protons. So what is important to remember is that when we use contrast agent in proton MRI, we don't look at contrast agents. We look at what these contrast agents are doing to water protons. And what they do to water protons is they change the relaxation times. And relaxation times is the parameter that describes the relaxation of those nuclear spins that we can flip over, you know, tip from their equilibrium by using external magnetic fields. So when you have something that is just sits in equilibrium of nuclear spins, it doesn't have a lot of polarized nuclear spins. To do MRI, you need to polarize them. You need to put something that is in equilibrium state and turn it into non-equilibrium by using external magnetic field. Then you have one in a billion or 10 in a million, depending on the, uh, the, the strength of your field, of those water protons that will be polarized in this external magnetic field. And then you can play with them by using additional magnetic fields and looking at the signal that these uh, spins will be generating when they're moving from non-equilibrium to equilibrium state. And uh, this is usually characterized by using two time-related parameters. If you look at the 
how the MR signal depends from these times, it's not obvious. Obviously, when you're working with isotopes, it's more or less easy, or other imaging techniques where basically you're looking at the interaction of um, radiation with various um, uh, structures in, in the objects that you're imaging. Here, those contrast agents are affecting relaxation times of water protons. And if you look at this, these, all these equations, and I'm sure that you will uh, not enjoy it looking at this very long time, but I guess the point is that this concentration dependence of, from the concentration, let's say, of gadolinium, which is a paramagnetic contrast agent, is not that easily associated with these uh, time-related uh, parameters from which you build your signal intensity. So doing quantification in, in MRI is not easy. But what you can do is uh, a result of the dependence of from the, all these parameters that are related to water dynamics is that you can use your water as your friend in generating those images and uh, manipulating those uh, contrast effects to gain the additional signal and additional sensing effects. It easily can be seen in those systems where you, let's say, you encapsulate something in the liposomes. And a long time ago, from these works that you know, primarily came from Lip Huang's lab many years ago, when uh, the radiologists and uh, drug delivery people started to look at what happens if you put the uh, paramagnetic elements into liposome. Turns out that you can use a variety of different external stimuli, let's say, to change the integrity of the membrane of the liposome, for example, where all these contrast agents will start to leave such a, a liposome, and as a result, their ability to interact with water that comes in and comes out is changing. So that can be used in designing those sensing um, nanostructures that can be used in imaging, which is kind of important. They're smaller structures that can be also used in nanoscale um, as contrast agents. Let's say fullerene that can bind gadolinium, but in this case, obviously those systems will be much more permeable for water, so you can't use the same effect. So in addition to very, very small molecules such as gadolinium chelates that can affect water, nanoparticles can be used also for this purpose, except that they will impart a, an additional effect which is related to uh, modifying the frequencies at which those uh, vectors of magnetizations of those uh, water proton spins change over time. And they can generate in addition also those micro -homogene homogeneities that can be detected with special pulse sequences that are specially tuned to detect so-called T2 effects. So this is one of those very early examples, and I worked with uh, these nanoparticles a long, long time ago. And at that time, everybody was very enthusiastic about moving those into clinical trials because these uh, nanoparticles consist of magnetite, essentially a small nanocrystal of magnetite, which is covered with the molecules of uh, oligosaccharide, the polysaccharide. And it seemed to be very easy because you can make them relatively homogeneous they're uh, monocrystalline in the ideal and uh, preparation uh, method you can use for making those particles. And it, everything seemed to be fine. If you look at what happens when you have to inject a certain amount of this contrast agent to generate contrast in a human, it's easy to see that uh, on the average, around two and a to five milligram of iron should be injected. It seems like it's a very small amount, right? So it should be relatively easy to tolerate, which is true. So it's about 175 milligrams per human. And you look at all these numbers here, basically the home take message is that there are a lot of particles of that very small size that need to be injected. And these particles have a huge surface area. So and this is something that we really didn't think about at that time. It's, it is something that people are thinking about all the time these days. This is 1,700 square meters, which is approximately a half of standard football field, if you think about it in, a, like in human uh, parameters. So it's a lot, of, a lot of area. And what can happen in the process, if your coating is not ideal, this 
coating can interact with the components of blood. And what happens is the polysaccharide binds lectins, the lectins activate, activate the converted C3 complex. As a result, you have a, a release of molecules which human body really does not appreciate. I.e., you can generate in some humans, in some, some subjects, effects that are completely were not anticipated in, at that time. I.e., that you will have at, in, at all the effects that are associated with local or systemic inflammation and changes of blood flow, increased permeability, extravasation of white blood cells. So that are rare but very, very important side effects that you can anticipate if you understand the biochemistry of the surface interactions in biological systems, which is a very important thing to remember. So at that time, when, when the, we first became aware of the effects that can um, uh, result in side effects, we were thinking why we shouldn't be not trying to encapsulate those super paramagnetic agents. And at that time, we decided that, well, the easiest thing to do is to coat everything with lipids that the body doesn't understand. So we, we thought, well, we'll put them in liposomes and make them pegylated. And uh, what the convenient part, something that you can potentially use in, in those systems, is to use the, to use the aldehyde, endogenous aldehyde groups, or generated aldehyde groups. At that time, we generated them by mild uh, oxidation that can interact with lipids and this interaction will be reversible. So we used aminophospholipids to which those particles attached when we encapsulated them in liposomes as a result of extrusion or reverse phase evaporation, and then removed the particles that were sitting outside liposomes by changing pH. So what happens when you put those small particles into liposome? What happens is that your relaxivity, the ability of those particles to uh, cause the dephasing of, of, of water proton spins increases many, many fold because you then put them close together. At the same time, all these T1 effects are not changing very much, if at all, because of the considerable barriers to water diffusion. So this was an interesting thing that I just recently had to revise and, 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 and review again. And what is interesting that people are still putting particles into liposomes to do a variety of things in cancer models, which I think is interesting to remember, that the effort is still on. Like, for example, there are so-called fairy liposomes that can be made magnetic, and then you can drag them, those fairy liposomes in the tumors, and this imaging, this MR imaging, shows that the T1 effects are killed as a result of these liposomal accumulation in the tumors when the magnet is, is applied externally. So it's a pretty interesting approach. And this is a, just a simple example, of probably one of the best images of tumors that were treated with liposomes with those super paramagnetic particles inside. And what this group of authors from Johns Hopkins demonstrated that targeting, additional targeting of these liposomes to blood vessels and the tumors doesn't really help in generating T2 contrast, i.e. there is a removal of these liposomes that happens faster. But I just wanted to attract your attention to this image, which has this amazing quality in terms of the ability to tell where are these areas of super paramagnetic contrast agent accumulation. So this work still continues. Our, our effort, on, on, on the other hand, was still to use small molecules because we were thinking about um, that it, it's kind of easier to, to think about clinical translation in terms of the small molecule use for in vivo imaging. And we were thinking about what can be this biochemical marker that we really want to image. And then the idea of um, imaging neutrophils came up. So neutrophils are amazing cells because they are the most numerous uh, nucleated cells that are present in the circulation at any, any given time. There are about 9 billion of these cells, and these cells are packed, um, in, uh, packed with the enzymes that you could potentially image using sensors that will be detecting enzymatic activity. So these cells are constantly migrating from the bloodstream into the matrix, 
and they are secreting those proteolytic enzymes that are contained within special granules. So there, as I said, there's six to seven billion cells in circulation every time, every, every minute, each one of us is injecting three million of these cells into circulation. So they're very numerous. And they usually followed by monocytes. So they are the, prim the primary responders of the innate immune system. So the idea was that we can use the enzymes that are contained in these granules and these cells as the images of markers of inflammation. So the neutrophils are not only uh, act as the cells that secrete enzymes. They also pop open like this and create nets around the areas where they get activated. So they additionally trap cells that trap bacteria. They, they, that's, that's a very interesting part. So they are externalization of these enzymes. That's why we probably can detect them. And if you look at what happens in inflammation, and this is just a little glimpse and not, it's a complicated picture, but it probably reflects only very few events are they actually happening. But when they are leukocytes interacting with endothelial cells that align blood vessels, they activate the assembly of the enzymes that are generating superoxide, which is important to remember, which is a source of hydrogen peroxide which is utilized by those enzymes, those, those peroxidase-like enzymes that are released from the cells, the, these neutrophils that are usually migrating from the adventitial side, not from the, the, where, from the blood, but from the adventitial side of the blood, blood vessel, something that also important to remember. So cells are loaded with enzymes. How do we detect those enzymatic markers of inflammation? What, what, is, what is the trick? So, if you think about it, in imaging, there are two simple approaches that you can use to detect enzymatic activity. It can be a macromolecule and nanoparticle, as already said, and then it can be followed by hydrolysis. So there is a lysis, fragmentation of those big molecules into small molecules, and if those small molecules are retained, then they can be detected. If they are not retained, then detection is certainly more problematic. If you have small molecules, then you need to think about something that um, will make them, these molecules, able to polymerize. When you get uh, the formation of these oligomers, and these oligomers can be retained at the, in the imaging site as a result of some kind of a polymerase that you're imaging. But in our case, it was neither, but polymerization was there. So we chose the method of building larger molecules from small ones rather than the, the other one, where the large molecules are fragmented. So we wanted to use small substrates of these mammalian peroxidases to see those imageable products that can be formed on, on sub-nano or nanoscale in vivo and retained. So for this purpose, a while ago, while I was at Mass General, we were thinking about the chemistry that we can use to do this and we came up with this uh, open chelate of gadolinium that has these groups here, which are essentially, essentially hydroxy tryptamide groups that work as the molecules that can reduce inactive peroxidase to its active state. So this is not the true substrate of peroxidase, but a helper molecule that makes this enzyme to jump back to its catalytically active uh, state. So if you look at this first image that we got, this is the image of the tube that had the substrate that had this paramagnetic gadolinium. So it was affecting water, and water became brighter. If we add the enzyme there in the presence of the true substrate, which is obviously hydrogen peroxide, the signal was increasing manifold. So this was a demonstration. We actually can do something with enzymes and the substrates that contain those paramagnetic elements to make them visible. And when we measured the effect, the effect was almost two and a half fold, which is a lot in MRI where you have relaxivity increasing. So the ability of gadolinium to shorten relaxation times of water was increasing, manifold. So relaxivity increases, and then it means that the MR signal will increase. And that exactly what we observed in imaging experiments of the concentration dependence was there. And when we took the products from this tube and looked with mass spec, 
to see what happens with the products. It turns out that this, our assumption was correct. So there is a polymerization, there's an addition of monomeric unit to these substrates, uh, to, to the products of the, the enzymatic reaction. So there is a polymerization, there's a formation of molecules that are bigger. So what are the applications of such, um, such imaging approach? What can be done is that MRI can be used to image inflammation in the brain vascular uh, supply. Why the brain and why inflammation? So if you look at what happens when those uh, enzymes are arriving to the site where they can externalize, it turns out that the myeloperoxidase is capable of chemically modifying proteins that sit in extracellular matrix. And this is a bad thing because the body usually recognizes those as foreign. There is an additional uh, accumulation of macrophages. They, uh, you know, they, they munch those neutrophils there. They, they become activated. There's a formation of foam cells that's happening there, especially when something happens with the chemical modification of apolipoproteins. It's really a bad thing. So, um, it's, it's, again, just to reiterate, this is the marker of inflammation which is also doing harm. So it's, a, it's important to image something like this. And the brain, obviously, the you know, MRI is a, is a good modality to image brain. So we were looking for applications. In the meantime, we were also looking at the large animal models of atherosclerosis. And those large animal models are primarily rabbits. And what you know, probably know that about rabbits, that rabbits are amazingly healthy creatures. So generating atherosclerosis in, in rabbits is a very difficult task. And the funny part is that they can develop atherosclerosis, even if they are uh, perfectly happy if you modify their diet. The only problem with those animals is that it takes a very long time to generate atherosclerosis. Enough. But that was this feasibility experiment in large animal models that allowed us to move to um, the animal models of um, vascular inflammation. And this particular time-dependent experiment just shows that if we use the special agent that is detecting mild peroxidase activity, we can see its accumulation over time. It just stays there in the atherosclerotic plaque. Well, it's if the uh, contrast agent is not interacting with the, the enzyme, it just continues to slowly remove from the, from the site of imaging. And so that uh, kind of told us that we can look for clinical applications that probably will be more realistic because we will be, you know, supplying some need that is, I mean, uh, addressing some need that is not currently addressed by existing imaging protocols. So we're looking at the models of brain aneurysm and stability. One of the reasons is because the group that works at our department, which is famous for their work in neurointerventional radiology, was very interested in looking at the aneurysms that are unstable. And the brain aneurysms are relatively rare. It's a relatively rare disease, but the brain aneurysms that are you know, they're silent and um, present in the population is relatively common. Uh, but only about between 30 and 40,000 people every year are affected by it. And if they're affected, the findings are usually incidental. And if the aneurysms are symptomatic, that means that they need to be treated. So essentially, you have a ticking bomb in your brain. If this aneurysm, this, for, uh, this one is on the middle, cerebral artery, if this thing bursts, you have a massive hemorrhage uh, that is, will be affecting uh, the large portion of the brain and the consequences are usually terrible. So this disease costs between six and five billion dollars in the U.S. to treat. The mortality of the procedures of that, that are used to treat them before they burst are, are relatively low, but morbidity is relatively high. And the risk of treatment of, of this condition can exceed natural history. And you can see that the, the number of cases that are treated every year are increasing, at least through 
2008, the statistic that I have, and most of these aneurysms are treated with the neurointerventional procedure when the coil is deployed in this aneurysm and it gets thrombosed. But a lot of them are surgically uh, treated as well. So uh, it's actually important to tell whether this aneurysm is, ro uh, is, is, is worth treating or not. So we talked about a lot, well, I talked a lot about the myeloperoxidase imaging. So the question is whether this myeloperoxidase imaging is even important or relevant to, um, to, to those aneurysms. So there is clinical significance, and there is a considerable number of people who are being treated surgically. So what we decided to do is to collect surgical samples and look whether myeloperoxidase expression in any way correlates with the increased risk of rupture. And it turns out that if you take all these cases and look at the myeloperoxidase negative patients and those that are positive, those that are positive have actually statistically higher significant um, risk of developing a rupture within five years. So this is really is a confirmation of our hypothesis that it is important to look at those people who uh, have myeloperoxidase positive aneurysms as opposed to negative and treat them more expediently so they do not develop the rupture. Those, those who are not uh, positive for this marker, they can additionally develop probably the pharmacological approach and then move to treatment to decrease the risk of uh, side effects of the, of the treatment. So when we looked at the samples that were um, you know, delivered to us by neurosurgeons, one of the things that we observed is that there was definitely a sign of expression of uh, those markers that are present in, in the neutrophils. So th they are unruptured human aneurysms that are positive for elastase, they are positive for myeloperoxidase, and those aneurysms also look very ugly. If you look at them, this, they look like big blabs that have a lot of and, you know, in homogeneity in, in, on the surface. And in addition, you know, with, the, with the regular histology, you can detect plenty of myeloperoxidase positive cells. So the question is, how do they move faster from these samples that are available from human patients to the clinics? You know, testing a contrast agent in human patients is a great thing, except that since we test it in large amounts, so the doses are relatively large, then it it's simply qualifies as a regular drug. So it's very expensive to go through the regular clinical trials with contrast agents that are designed for MRI. So thinking about collaborating with people who do micro-MRI. So what they do is they use high-field MRI and they use histology samples and they put them in the special coils that look at these clips. And just by looking at a relatively thin section and acquiring many images, you can get the image of uh, essentially with histology qualities, but it's obtained with MRI. So what you're looking at here are the T1 signals in the slice of a mouse brain. And you can do it in T1 and T2 mode and then compare with histology, just with a visible microscopy. So we decided to take the, sa the same approach and take the surgical specimen that were obtained from the patients who got their surgery, and uh, some of them survived better, some of them not, but it, you know, all of these samples were, um, you know, we obtained by, under IRB at our university, and then looked with the, uh, the, the uh, MRI at the signals that we observed after incubating the samples with the contrast agent that we wanted to test. So we were thinking about it as, as a potential alternative to those preclinical trials so we can get a better understanding whether it can make sense to move to the next phase or not. And you can see that there are areas of definite in, in enhancement in these samples that we were looking. So that we're currently investigating what these areas are. And when we do, in parallel, uh, the imaging of the enzymatic activity using fluorescent substrates, because we can also make fluorescent substrates, and take parallel sections and 
try to see whether those areas coincide with what we see with, with MRI, we detect in many cases, especially in unruptured aneurysms, that there are very small focal areas that are positive for myeloperoxidase that we can detect in parallel by using this micro MRI technique. So this is uh, certainly great, but you know, we also need to develop imaging protocols in real big animal models. And there is an approach where you can generate aneurysmal-like structures in rabbits. The only thing, as I already mentioned, rabbits do usually do not develop any inflammation of the blood vessels. So you have to introduce this inflammation artificially. And this is done with this relatively uh, delicate procedure where you can put a microcatheter in those aneurysms and inject through a very thin hypertube inflammation-promoting agent, so you get, you know where inflammation is. There is, in terms of hemodynamics, this is a structure which is ideal in modeling human aneurysm and has very similar blood flow parameters. So that, we, we published this work a, a number of years ago as an approach of focally inducing inflammation in the blood vessel wall, which is certainly, is, it was a turning point in generating those reproducible models of vascular wall inflammation. And then we worked a while, and this is it's a really complex thing, we worked on the problem of solving the problem of nonlinear flow. So aneurysms, they're certainly structures that are closed, and they're open on one side, and the blood goes in, and it's nonlinear there. And when the blood is nonlinear, MR starts to give you false positive results because you see the effects of flow. So we had to eliminate the flow effect in the blood vessels and at the same time be able to image vascular walls. So we, we worked for a while on designing those so-called mo motion-sensitized driven equilibrium pulse sequences, which are used in MRI usually to image vascular wall including humans. So that's, that's the protocol. We, we took those animals and you know, did the phantom experiments, induced the inflammation, and did the imaging, re-imaging, and did all the statistics, all the um, post-processing, and uh, the, also analyzed the tissues for local inflammation. And then it turned out that, as we suspected, in those animals that were imaged with this pulse sequence and had this induced inflammation, and were injected with the contrast agents that are interacting with myeloperoxidase, we could detect this increased signal in um, those areas, areas of interest. So it was additionally uh, supporting this hypothesis that you can image local inflammation using uh, those substrates. But you know, as I already mentioned, the real substrate of peroxidase is hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide is very limited. And so the, the question is how you can utilize the existing sources of hydrogen peroxide to do imaging. And we, at some point, a long time ago, decided to look at the linked systems of glucose oxidase and peroxidase to image uh, things in vivo, such as receptor expressions. And this was work, work that was done in the models of cancer relatively long time ago using a completely different imaging technique. It was done with positron emission tomography. And the reason why it makes sense to do it with PET is because, you know, if you make conjugates of antibodies that interact with the receptors, the half-life of uh, these conjugates in blood is long. And the half-life of the isotopes that you're attaching to those antibodies targeted to the receptor is, is relatively short. So you never really get the, complex, the complete picture, picture of, of targeted accumulation of these antibodies anywhere using PET. So the idea was that we will do pre-targeting with the conjugates of, of the antibodies and then a pair of enzyme and then inject uh, this uh, substrate of, of peroxidase. But for generating hydrogen peroxide, we used another enzyme that was attached to the identical antibody fragments, so there were a pair of those. And with pre-targeting, we were actually able to see uh, quantitative differences in accumulation 
of uh, 68 gallium isotope, which has only this, this short uh, half-life of 68 minutes. Uh, when, in, you know, when we looked at the same animals with the tumors that were implanted in the, in the bone, so this is the model of metastatic uh, adenocarcinoma in, into the bone. The, there were quantitative differences in, in, in the pre-targeting and just the plain substrate injection experiments. So uh, using glucose oxidase as, as a source of peroxide is a possibility. But it's certainly not uh, possible in the situation when you, are, you want to image something in a blood vessel without causing additional damage to the system. So we're thinking about superoxide as a potential source of hydrogen peroxide. So the question is how we can utilize hydrogen um, and superoxide as a source of hydrogen peroxide in the real system. So we turn to metalloenzymes, and you know that the metalloenzymes they are capable of um, causing the dismutation of superoxide with the formation of hydrogen peroxide, but uh, using the real superoxide is really inconvenient, so we're thinking about using the mimetics of superoxide, such as macrocyclic manganese complexes. So the idea was that we will take those manganese-containing uh, molecules and use them as the superoxide mimetic that will generate hydrogen peroxide, and the process, they will be attached to the surface where the, um, you know, the reaction happens, so we'll be able to detect them. And the reason why we can be able to detect them is because of the manganese, because manganese is a super is a paramagnetic element which we can directly image with MRI. So the cool part of this is this is ideal theranostic agent because it's canonical. It has this manganese part that does this enzyme-like effect and at the same time it can be imaged with, with, by using MRI. So it was quite an interesting thing. And before we moved to the real substrate, we decided to put those manganese complexes into liposomes again and see whether we can image them. And you can see that with extrusion, you can generate liposomes that contain it. Then uh, we, we tested the activity of the liposomes using this fluorescent method that allows you to look at the dismutation parameters. And what we detected is that the complex, the, the mimetic of superoxide dismutase and their liposomal formulation have elevated activity in terms of the changing of the Vmax, the initial enzymatic uh, rate uh, uh, compared to the uh, superoxide dismutase alone. So this was an indication that the system does work. And another interesting thing that we observed is that if you put those uh, paramagnetic complexes in the liposomes, they have a relatively long T1. So the relaxation time is long. This means that there is the water problems here, the water, water diffusion problems. If you lyse those liposomes, those are released and the T1 is getting shortened. So it's another proof that we actually successfully put them into liposomes. And as I already said, manganese is paramagnetic, so it has a relaxivity, which is pretty good for imaging. We did these brain imaging experiments in mice. We looked at the kinetics of signal increase in various brain areas by using fast imaging with a relatively small dose of contrast agent. And what we observed is that subcortical instead of cortical areas were injected, I mean, enhanced uh, more than uh, the other areas of, of the brain uh, with the exception of um, um, pituitary gland, of course, because that's, it's basically supplied by the blood directly. And what the analysis of, of all these images, which is the, the most important conclusion, was that what we actually uh, now have a hypothesis of how these mimetics are penetrating in the brain. So it doesn't happen through the blood-brain barrier penetration directly, but it, instead they are exchanging with the CSF through a choroid plexus. So it looks like that liposomes are exchanging the components with the um, uh, CSF there. Um, so that is uh, pretty much what I wanted to tell you about those, those enzyme-related and in, in the substrate-related approaches. 
for imaging uh, the vascular wall and, the, and all these themes that we're working on. And I guess the four most important things that I wanted to, you to, to kind of remember as the take home message is that you can make those nanoformulations of traditional imaging agents that will always give you something new in terms of the properties in the signal generation arena. So that's number one. So the second thing is that if you work with nanoparticles and use it for imaging, especially for MR imaging, it's always better to know what happens to these nanoparticle surfaces before you go into something big as trying to implement it in a large trial, just to understand how you better can manipulate um, surface to avoid potential complications. The third, the very important thing from my work and from all these years I spent at uh, UMass Medical School is that it now completely uh, obvious that MPO specific contrast agents uh, show the significant increases in the, uh, the imaging signals and they're specific and they can be related to the inflammation, local inflammation of the vascular wall. And the fourth, the more new direction that we're going with the chemical synthesis of new manganese uh, closed macrocycles as superoxide dismutase mimetics is that such contrast agents can work as theranostics. So it's one of the interesting classes of molecules that can produce directly, well, directly as they can because they're influencing uh, relaxation parameters of water as I already mentioned. But it's the center that has enzymatic activity and it's also an imaging molecule. So with this, I wanted to thank a lot of people that participated in, in this research, especially our neurointerventional group, uh, our collaborations with the various institutions, and especially when YU recently, and all the animal models of cancer that were developed at, in Germany, in, in German Center for Cancer Research, and the, our current collaborations with Martina Center and MGH and the funding that um, I got through, in, in, through the years to do this work. And thank you very much for your attention. And again, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, the source of the MPO, the enzyme, yeah. the uh, neutrophil. Right. So the neutrophil has to be there, and it is there, mm -hmm. but in response to the formula. Mm -hmm. So then what you were doing here is you have to do a something like calculate the activity of the enzyme, and the source of the proxies is the proxy. Yeah, so, so we, we work on two things. The first is gadolinium complex, and the other is manganese complex. So gadolinium complex is a, is a molecule that is reducing myeloperoxidase to catalytic active state. And when it happens, th there is a ligand attached to this molecule that gets oxidized. When it gets oxidized, it becomes reactive. And it becomes reactive, it reacts, it reacts with tyrosines on, on, on proteins. And then stays there. Yeah, with, with manganese complexes, essentially it's the same thing. The only thing is that manganese is also capable of dismutating superoxide. So it gener generates more uh, hydrogen peroxide for, for myeloperoxidase. So our hope is that it's going to be a better substrate. Yeah, so that... Uh -huh. So what happens with neutrophils that get activated on site, they degranulate. So, so they, they, they pop everything open. And this myeloperoxidase it sits, we actually see it with histology, not only inside the cells, but all around the place. So, so it gets externalized. And that's the reason why it works. Because you're absolutely correct. It was in the cell, they, they will be cleared with macrophages, they are cleared by macrophages. That's why they're myeloperoxidase positive macrophages because they remove neutrophils. 
So that's not going to be working that well. Yeah, so, uh -huh. yeah, so they, they do, they do pop. Yeah, yeah. I think so. If the uh, well, <laughs> it's a copper enzyme. Well, it's it's not as good as, as manganese, and manganese is much better in terms of the. Yeah, it's a mitochondrial enzyme. Yeah, it's it's paramagnetic. If you put tons of let's let's see how many manganese atoms are in superoxide uh, dismutase. Yeah, well, it depends on that, I guess, aggregation state. Well, usually one, yeah, right. So, and, and the rest is not generating any signal. So to generate the equivalent signal to the small chelate, you just need to inject a lot of superoxide in this mutate. So, in this regard, uh, like, uh, commercial engineers, like, uh, they have to make the Yes, packing is important because, again, if you want to use something as a contrast agent for MRI, it needs to have water in this coordination sphere and water needs to be exchanged. So water can't be exchanged too quickly, it can be changed too slowly, it needs to be just right. And if you have something that's poorly water soluble and contains paramagnetic elements, most likely it's going to produce super paramagnetic uh, effects, just like iron that sits in in this iron oxide, but it's not going to give you a very good T1 effect. If it gets dissociated in the process somewhere locally, they'll become more efficient as a T1 contrast agent. Yes, I'm absolutely sure that manganese porphyrins can be used for this. You just need to, need to make them disaggregated to, to some extent. It can be done with some, in some polymeric micelles if they're not going too deep into the core, into the hydrophobic core. So yeah, these formulations can be. Yes, I did. Yeah. They are, but they are not very good T1 agent. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about uh, using those for imaging in combination with the psychologists? We are interested in using them as drugs to prove this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, is the Definitely. You know, there is nothing that MRI is more sensitive to than um, param super paramagnetic iron oxides. It really is very sensitive to the presence of those particles. Uh, the problem is that is, uh, yeah, if you want to get quantitative results, it's very difficult to do quantification. It's still the matter of debate. But there are special pulse sequences for imaging those nanoparticles that by the size of the artifact, uh, you, you can kind of predict how much of those particles are there. So yes, but it, it certainly is, is a very... You know, there was a publication from 1990s that they did in the cells that were overexpressing a receptor of helping cells to externalize, I mean, internalize those, those, those particles that showed that we can really push the sensitivity limits up. We published some marker page tracking of the signal. Hmm. Anyway, we can't reach it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, please. So you just said that uh, there's nothing more uh, responsive. I mean, the iron oxide would induce uh, relaxivity more than any other agent. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's really nothing that you can do for MRI that you know, a MAR pulse sequence can detect in smaller amounts in terms of the molar quantities of certain contrast agent. Compared to, you know, it, 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 iron oxides are probably the most um, responsive. So why has it not been adopted more in clinical use? I mean, gadolinium still way dominates, right? Right. So not only it was not adopted, there are attempts currently that you know, people are trying to license back those patents and make these, again, these iron oxides, try to push them through clinics again to do lymphotropic imaging in cancer when you want to see which lymph nodes are abnormal as it may contain micrometastases, especially for prostate cancer uh, imaging. But the problem is, again, that there, there is some unexplained uh, side effects, and I think the FDA in 2004, when they were reviewing Combidex, there were questions about this, and those questions were not adequately addressed. And there are some companies that still continue uh, making the iron oxides, and then recently they were kind of scaling down because of the uh, lack of use, mainly, and side effects. So these side effects, they're, they're, not, not, they're not lethal side effects but they cause considerable concern of the regulatory uh, bodies. So a typical dose of a gadolinium-based agent is like 0.1 millimole per kilogram. Right. So what about for iron oxide? What would be a, a dose that would give the same extent of contrast? No, it, it, the doses are much smaller, it's about 2 to 5 milligram per kig. So it, I, I, it, I calculated somewhere that it was between 150 and 175 milligrams per, per human. And the, the, so it, in terms of the amount of contrast, it's, it's less. The problem is that if gadolinium is properly administered in the patients that, uh, and, and um, those individuals, they have normal kidney function, they do not really cause any problems. The iron oxides circulate in the bloodstream and accumulate and being excreted for much longer periods of time, and they cause, um, more frequently cause some side effects, which nobody really has a good explanation for. 